Every breath we take is a gift of God. Everything that we get to do comes from Him. You know, whether that is for work or whether that is for pleasure or for any other activity that we have, all thanks be to Him, right? For His indescribable gift. If you have your copy of God's Word this morning, we're going to be in Mark chapter 3. Today we will complete Mark chapter 3. We are making our way slowly through the Gospel of Mark in its 16 different chapters. And so today we will finish up to there. Speaking of breath, it comes in our lungs as a, a runner. That's something I'm keenly aware of. Many of you thought I would be gone today because today in Oklahoma City, the Memorial Marathon is being run. It is a race that I have run on four different occasions, three times as a half and once as a full marathon. And because it is Oklahoma, I have fond memories of running that race in the wet and cold with temperatures in the 30s. And yet I've also been there in the hot sunshine with temperatures that topped out at nearly 80. Yeah, have fun preparing for a day like that. I was emotionally moved the first time I participated as I ran past banners that had faces and names depicting the 168 people who, who lost their life that day. And I laughed really hard the last year that I ran as a lady cheered us on from her driveway and thanked us loudly for running because it forced the city to actually fix her pothole-ridden street. That was amazing. However, one of, my, one of my best memories is actually being on TV with the marathon winner. It makes you think I did pretty good, huh? Well, they were interviewing him as I ran behind him, you know, as he's talking to the reporter, completing my half marathon. You see, he ran twice as far, twice as fast as I did, but I was on TV with him, right? So, I mean, that has to mean something. I mean, there's something there. Last week, an unknown man had a similar moment of glory at the London Marathon where he planned his sprint just right at the beginning of the race to move past that group of elite runners. You know, those guys that do that for a living, those people who make it look easy. And he did so so that he could say that he led the London Marathon for 10 seconds. <laughs> but nonetheless, he will forever be able to tell his children what? I led the London Marathon. But he eventually disappeared back into the pack of the 58,015 other participants that day. You know, he might not have finished first, but I believe that anybody who finishes is a winner in something like that. Some of my races were a struggle. Some of them were sublime. For me, the glorious solution was simply to finish and meet the goals that I had set for myself that day because I was not going to finish in the top five, the top 25, the top 105, this morning, we're going to see how some struggled with Jesus. Now, for believers, we think, really? Struggle with Jesus? But let's be honest. As believers, sometimes we struggle with Jesus. We don't always do what he says. We choose to reject what he has for us. And if you don't know Jesus, well, then you're in a struggle with him right now. Uh, and, and so, Man, sometimes we do. We face those struggles. But what we're going to see is not just these struggles, but we're going to see that he offers us a solution today, the perfect solution that will overcome the struggles that we face. So you might not have experienced the struggles or the glories of running, but I bet you have known some struggles, and I want you to know that Jesus is the solution that will change your life for the better, whether it is on this side of glory or on the other side of glory. So the question for you this morning is this, are you ready to say yes to Jesus' solution that will overcome whatever struggle, whether small or large, that you're facing today? 
Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we do thank you for this day. God, we are thankful for the breath that you give us, whether we are following you at a leisurely pace or whether we are in a full tilt run after you and anything else that's going on. God, I pray that you will give us ears to hear. God, I pray that you will help us to understand the truth that you're sharing to us. And more than any of that, God, I pray that as your spirit draws us to yourself today, that we will respond to what it is that you are calling us, to the truth, to the beauty, to the wonder of who you are. And it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So let's look at Mark chapter 3 today. We're going to be starting in verse 29, or excuse me, verse 20, and then we're going to make our way through the rest of the end of the chapter. And this is what it says, And he came home, and the crowds gathered again to such an extent that he could not even eat a meal. That's a lot of folks. When his own people heard this, that's his family, they went out to take custody of him, for they were saying, he has lost his senses. Let that sink in. His family has said that the almighty creator of the universe, whom his mother Mary has intimate knowledge of, right? Because an angel visited her. And great things happened around his birth. We're going to go get Jesus from Nazareth because he is out of his ever-loving mind. That's, I mean, that's, that's a paraphrase there right there. But that's what's going on. So let's keep going. Verse 22 tells us that the scribes who had come down from Jerusalem, you know, these are the folks that had been following what Jesus was saying and what Jesus was doing, sometimes not always with the best intent. But they came down and they were saying that he is possessed by Beelzebub and that he cast out the demons by the ruler of the demons. And so Jesus called to himself all these folks, and this is what he did. He began speaking to them in parables. This is where we see this starting to happen. Is this because Jesus is wanting to add confusion to the mix? Not at all. He has been very clear in everything that he has said and everything that he has done. And a lot of people have got it, right? They're going, ooh, he must be the Messiah, the chosen one, the one who is going to save us from our sins. But yet there's also a very large group of people who have been saying, this guy is a crackpot. He is crazy. Uh, I mean, I don't care what he's saying or he's doing. Or they're saying, man, if he's throwing down this kind of truth and everybody's believing, what are they going to do about what I say? I mean, it's threatening my way of life, right? I mean, all of this is taking place right now. So Jesus is speaking in parables not to confuse the situation, but to cause people to have to think about what he is saying internalize it, apply it to themselves, see that there is truth in what's going on. And so this is what he says, continuing in verse 23, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, the kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. If Satan has raised up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but he is finished. But no one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his property unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder the house. Truly, I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven the sons of men, whether he blasphemes, whatever blasphemes he utters. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. And he said this because they were saying that he had an unclean spirit. And then we shift back and see that not only has his parents, you know, his family, excuse me, come to see him, now they are there. And they are gathered there along with these other people who have heard Jesus speak this parable. And it says in verse 31, then his mother and his brothers arrived and standing outside, right, because the, the house was crowded, they sent word to him and they called to him. A crowd was sitting around him and they said to him, hey, your mom, your brothers are outside for you. You know, you've gotten that as a kid, right? Psst, 
I think I heard your mom's calling for you. You better get home now, right? I mean, you saw the streetlights. They were on. It's time to go. So they're there. And answering them, he said, well, who are my mother and my brothers? You know, okay, outwardly, this looks sarcastic, but yet he's still, in, he's still making a point. He's still in parable mode here. Looking at those who were sitting around him, he said, behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. So historically, what is it that Mark wants us to see? What's going on here in this scripture that I have read? Mark wants us to see Jesus helping struggling people. There were some folks there that were struggling, right? Let's start off. Well, who were some folks that were struggling? Were Mary and Jesus' siblings, right? The ones that were actually the sons and daughters of Joseph. I mean, they were there and, and they were struggling because man, a lot of things have been going on with Jesus, right? I mean, he'd been there and now he's not able to eat, but, but there's also some other struggling people there. These religious leaders, the people who should have known better, well, they're struggling too. And then there's the group of people who are there to hear because they know they need something, but they just don't know what it is yet. They're there because they believe that the words of Jesus can help them. And so Mark wants us to see this. So Jesus has returned to Capernaum, Many people, so many, want his attention that, man, he's having a hard time eating, right? It's not enough time to get the food out of the microwave and scarf it down before more people want stuff from him. His family believes that he's lost his senses. The scribes and the Pharisees, they believe that he's actually of the devil. But amidst these struggles and those who are struggling, this is what Jesus addresses. He addresses the resistance of his family and the rejection of the religious leaders. And he offers them a solution that will forever change their lives if they will only receive it, if they will accept it, if they'll say, yes, I want what you're offering. And so theologically, you know, what are we going to see about God here? Mark wants us to see that Jesus is revealing the seriousness of our struggles. Sometimes we think our struggles just aren't a big deal, right? I'm just me being me. Or it's, it's, it's not that bad. The old man upstairs, he understands. You know, we got kind of an agreement. I'm good enough, right? Because, you know, I, I plan on doing more good stuff than bad stuff. And so we kind of hope that that's all going to filter out. And all that sounds great, except all that's a lie. I mean, that's not the way any of it actually works in life. And so Jesus is going to show us how serious it is to resist God, how serious it is for us to reject God, and and how important it is that we take the solution that he's offering, not because he's demanding it, but because it's the best for us, right? And so... Jesus saw resistance from his family concerning the work of God. His mother and his brothers wanted to have influence and control over Jesus because they thought their ways were better than his ways. That's resistance. They literally thought they knew better than him. Now, I know, do we ever think we know better than God? Yeah, we do. And and do we really sometimes really think that we can influence and bend God to our way of thinking? Maybe if I just talk him into it, right, God will surely see that, well, I'm right. But if we're right, then who has to be wrong? And he's never wrong. And so, I mean, that's the seriousness of what's going on. Literally, they were speaking You know, literally speaking, they arrived, they did, they stood, they sent word to Jesus, they called him out. However, it's kind of the extended meaning of these words that's going to show us the nature of their resistance. So let's kind of dive in and look at this. They moved towards wrong by going to apprehend Jesus, right? They were going to grab hold of him and take him home, grab him by the ear, grab him by the arm, whatever it took. And and so resistance starts with us, what? Moving towards that which is opposite of God. Moving towards wrong. That's where resistance kind of takes place. 
They expended a great amount of effort as they literally stood there, right? As they stood firm, we're not leaving, right? We're going to keep on. We're going to have resolve. And they were determined to persevere. And so I want you to think, when we resist God, think about the amount of effort we put in to saying, no, me over him. I mean, we do. We expend a lot of energy towards that. We shouldn't, but that's what resistance is. They made their efforts their purpose, all right? So when the Bible says that they sent word to him, the word in the original language is apostello. It's the word we get apostle from, right? Someone who is sent with a purpose and a message. So as apostles of Jesus, right, we're sent with a purpose and a message of him. But what was their purpose and their message? It was to bring him back. And so they made a purpose and a message of wrong their aim and their desires. So do you see how resistance is gravitating towards what's wrong? You know, that resistance is spending a lot of energy? That resistance is what? Man, ultimately here, resistance, we make it our purpose, and then we're not quiet about it because they were loud as they made their intentions, right? They called out to Jesus. And so sometimes our resistance is we just get loud for what we think is right. We get argumentative, you know? We try to justify things. We get angry because how dare you tell me that I'm wrong and God's right. And so that's resistance. We might still say, oh, I I like him. I, I, I know Mary loved her son. I know his siblings did. But do you see how that resistance kind of shaped what was going on? The earthly brothers of Jesus do not respond to the gospel message until after he rises from the grave. They grew up with the Son of God, and yet it took them till after the crucifixion and the resurrection to go, oh, that's some resistance. You and I, let's don't do that. I mean, we can. God lets us. It's not good for us. I did it. You've probably done it too. I hope you're not in the midst of doing it now. It's not the best for us, but that's what's going on right here. There's a great deal of effort expended on resisting Jesus. It's wasted, not just by his family, but by us. Man, let's don't be that kind of people. Are you resisting Jesus today by leaning towards those wrong things? By making an actual effort to pursue those wrong things? Or actually advocating that those wrong things are okay? Oh, let's don't resist that way. The actual mother and the siblings of Jesus were, though. And so if they can get kind of off track and do it, so can we. Let's let's look on. It wasn't just that his family resisted, but Jesus encountered straight-up rejection from religious leaders towards the work of God. These scribes from Jerusalem, they sought to discredit Jesus. They attempted to misrepresent Jesus, right? Literally speaking, they said he was possessed and cast out demons with the power of the devil, right? And so that's what they said. They're talking to God himself and saying, you're the fallen one. You're Lucifer. You're the one that rebelled in the high place. You were the one that was cast down out of heaven. When that's the furthest from the truth, because Jesus willingly stepped out of the glory of heaven and was born like us to be like us so that he could fix what we eternally messed up with sin, right? And so he's there, and they've totally missed out on this. And so Jesus questions what they believed, and then he warns them about blasphemy. The context of these actions are going to kind of help us to understand what's going on here. 
See, they wanted to have things their way. See, that's where rejection starts, okay? I want my way over God's way. They were trying to make the claim that Jesus uh, you know, uh, was possessed, and they were trying to make that be the reality of what was going on. And yet Solomon, the wisest of their elders, said this, there is a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. So when we try to say, oh, it's all my way and not God's way, I just want you to know Scripture tells us our way leads to destruction. I mean, yes, we can do some good things overall, but have you noticed how even the good things that we do tend to get perverted and turned into awful things, right? We are very creative at being able to take about anything, and perverting it into some sort of awful practice or awful weapon. I mean, we're, we're good. I mean, we can use our minds to create if we come up with some of the most beautiful and telling stories. And then sometimes, man, we can go to the, we can see mo horror movies, and you think, man, who in the world thought of this? This is awful. Man, in the same mind, right? Blessing and curses. And we can't be that way. They sought to drive out those who were different from themselves through false accusations. And so rejection of God is casting out people that are different than you. Oh, you're just a little too Jesus, right? Or I don't like what Jesus has said. That's hate speech. I mean, that's not love. You know, and so we're going to marginalize you and we're going to push you out and we're going to say your voice doesn't matter. I mean, that's straight up rejection, too. And so they falsely accused Jesus and tried to cancel him. Solomon gave this proverb as well People who despise advice are asking for trouble. And so those who are not interested in the counsel of God are bringing trouble upon themselves because his words are true. Not because I say them, but because they play out. They just are. And so they were warned by Jesus about their declared beliefs and prejudice. And so Jesus offered them a choice after his parable. And so I want you to think that rejection is that. Rejection ultimately is, I'm going to take what I believe in place of anything else, and I'm going to start sharing that, right? I'm going to start sharing this contrary truth. In fact, or we'll hear this in the, in the world today. Well, this is just my truth, and I'm speaking it. You can have your truth, but this is my truth. And it's like, truth is either truth or it's a lie. I mean, we can't equally hold diopposing opposite ideas and both claim them to be true. That is impossible. And so Jesus, he warns them. And this is what he says in Matthew's record of this particular account. The words you say will either acquit you or they will condemn you. Okay? So when we hold our truth up over God's truth, we are literally bringing condemnations upon ourselves. Not that God's doing it, right? We're declaring it. Our own words are bringing this upon ourselves. Ouch, I don't like that. But yet when we reject God, that's what we see. They were told by Jesus that if their lives remained unchanged, that they would be guilty of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So Matthew also records Jesus saying this at this particular time. Mark doesn't, but Matthew does. Anyone who isn't with me opposes me. Anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. So the rejection of God is our way over his. It's driving out opposition to our wrong ideas. It's actually putting to words our wrong belief, and it is an idea that is work. We are putting our effort to be contrary and opposing to the truth of God. That's where rejection puts us. It puts us as the enemy of God. Now, does God want to be our enemy? 
He does not. He wants to be our friend. He tells us this so. And so Jesus has offered this solution to them if they only respond, but what they're choosing to do instead is reject, to be against him. And so blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is not accidentally saying some particular set of words. It's not just taking God's name and using it wrong. It's not one action that just gets you in trouble and poof, you are done. It is a willing rejection of the Lord through repeated acts of sin, okay? It is a way of life. It is a lifestyle where you repeatedly say, me, not him, over and over and over again by the way that we choose to live and by the things that we choose to say. That's what it is. It's not that God will refuse to forgive us if we ask, but it is the fact that we as sinners refuse to ask. That's what blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is. That's why it's called the unpardonable sin. It's unpardonable because we don't ask for his pardon. There comes a point where our rejection becomes so strong that our heart becomes so hard that we are just not interested in the things of God anymore. Now, where is that tipping point? I, I don't know. But do I want to get anywhere close to that? No, I do not. It's like I've told you. If this was a 10-story drop down and I'm on the edge and this was real, I would not be standing here. I would be back as far as I could. Why get close? But if I'm on the 10th floor and there is a nice set of windows right here and I, it looks safe and secure, you bet I'm going to get all up and close because that's cool. You take out the glass and it's not so cool anymore, right? I'm just not going to do that. And so if you are living a life right now that is rejecting God as Savior, why get up to any point? Why not just cry out today, I want Jesus? And if you're a believer, why would you want to reject him just with the ways that you go? Not just reject, but resist him, right? Why would you want to resist the ways of God? Because you've already claimed that the ways of God are awesome, right? He saved my soul. He's changed my life. Why am I fighting against the one who loves me with everything? But we do. We don't need to. We totally do not need to. The law of Moses says it this way in the book of Numbers. But those who brazenly violate the Lord's will, whether native-born Israelites or foreigners, have blasphemed the Lord. They must be cut off from the community. Since they have treated the Lord's words with contempt and deliberately disobey his command, they must be completely cut off and suffer the punishment for their guilt. Now, listen to Jesus talk about these same things. These are Jesus' words. Where are they found? John chapter 3. Oh, you mean that awesome portion of Scripture where Jesus said, For God so loved the world? Yes, this part comes just a little bit after that. He who does not believe has been judged already hmm. because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. So this is what happened at Kadesh when the people refused to believe God would give them the promised land. And this is what will happen to everyone else who refuses to believe the promises of the kingdom of God. That's blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. It's rejecting him and all that he offers. This is why Jesus wants us to see that resistance leads to rejection unless you receive what he offers. Thank God Jesus said at the beginning of John 3, 18, he who believes in him is not judged. So we have a choice. What is that choice? To believe. What does it mean to actually believe? Is it just a thought? Oh, I can agree with? Mm -mm. When to believe something biblically, if we're going to look at what that word, that the essence of that word is faith. 
But what does it mean? It means I believe, I agree, and I now act. And so if I believe that Jesus is the one and only Savior of the world, that he can forgive me of my sins, and I agree with that, right? Then that means if I agree with it, I have to respond and say, please, Jesus, give that to me, right? And not just please, Jesus, give that to me and forgive me, but please, Jesus, let me follow you with all of my life from this point forward because that's going to be my new way of life because I belong to you. And so if I'm not living that, then have I really believed it? Have I really put that faith into action? Well, no, because I'm not acting, right? And so somewhere in that, I'm either resisting him or I'm still outright rejecting him. I need to respond. Jesus' family would respond. We will see later that some of these religious leaders, they too will respond. And so the question is going to come for you and I this morning is, are you going to respond? Because Jesus wanted everyone to receive the work of God. And so what does that mean? That means you must live solely life focused on him. How do I know that? Because Jesus said, we cannot serve two masters, for we will either hate one and love the other, or we will be devoted to one and despise the other. It's an either or. I cannot say Jesus and and be a Jesus person. Jesus person means it's all Jesus and nothing else. And you might say, I can't do that. And I'm going to say, you're right. You can't do it by yourself. Jesus has to change us on the inside to make that happen. And then he sticks with us after we become Jesus people to help us do that. Because I'm going to tell you, I don't even do it perfect. I still do dumb stuff. But thankfully, he forgives me and continues to help me and encourage me and guide me and move me on. But what does it mean to receive? It means you can be set free. You remember that strong man that we talked about? That's our sin, and it can be bound. Scripture says, so if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Is there anything too big that God can't set us free from? No. Can he set us free from our sins? Absolutely. Can he set us free to have a new way of life? Absolutely. What does it mean to be free? <gasps> oh, man, that's the breath in our lungs, right? I mean, that is everything to be free. That's what God offers us. I'm here to tell you, whether you realize it or not, sin constrains you like it's binding you, like it's cuffed you, like it's in control of you, and it will never let you go. No matter how hard you try to break and pull against the cuffs and the chains, you will never break them. But Jesus can not only break them, he can remove them away forever. That's what we need him to do. Jesus says all sins can be forgiven. Now you said, but wait a minute, blasphemy the Holy Spirit. That's just ultimately saying no, right? Listen to this. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, all wickedness. And so when we ask him to forgive us, when we desire to have him and not us, well, that means we're not too far gone, are we? Because we still have that desire. We still have that want to. Today, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can, and you don't have to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. There is still hope for you. I want to ask you to bow your heads and to close your eyes this morning. I want to give you a chance to respond to the truth that's been said. Practically, I want you to know this. You need to ask Jesus for forgiveness. From your wrong attitudes, your wrong actions, if you're Jesus people, you can do that where you're sitting this morning. Maybe you want to come forward and pray at these steps. Maybe you want me to pray for you or with you. I'm willing to do that. But we don't need to play around with resisting God. Let God forgive you. We need to avail ourselves of Jesus by being accounted part of his family. Maybe you don't have a church home. I want you to know, hey, First Baptist, we'd love to have you. If you have questions about what it means to be a part of who we are, come forward and talk to me. Catch me after the service. 
But here is the utmost, most important thing I want you to get today. You need to accept Jesus' offer of salvation. If you're not a Jesus person, you can be. You need to agree that the wrong of sin separates you from God. Yeah, I don't like that. Don't want to be a part of that. You need to believe that Jesus alone can save you from your sin. Hey, it's one way, but it's one way that works 100% of the time. And you just need to confess that you want to live your life for him, that you want to do it his way, because his way is better. The Bible tells us that God's love. Who doesn't want to love love? Real love. Whatever it is that God's calling you to do today, respond. Put it into action. Don't let anything hold you back.